Today is August 28th, 2023, and my guest is Michael Munger of Duke University. He hosts the podcast, The Answer is Transaction Costs. This is Mike's 46th appearance on Econ Talk. He was last here in June of 2023 talking about obedience to the unenforceable. Michael, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks, Russ. Our topic for today is an essay you wrote on the trolley problem in Adam Smith. I want to add, we're probably going to get in some, into some serious themes related to death. Uh, parents may wish to screen this episode before sharing it with children. Uh, let's start with the trolley problem. Uh, ages ago, back in 2015, we did an episode with Joshua Green, Harvard University, that spent some time on this philosophical hypothetical. Uh, what is the trolley problem? Trolley problem raises the question of what Philippa Foote, the philosopher who first kind of raised the question in a systematic way, at least in this context, called the doctrine of double effect or the difference between killing and allowing to die. And so the both of those two doctrines are actually quite ancient. And interestingly, for economists, these tend to be economists pretend that they're utilitarians or consequentialists, and that is the greatest good for the greatest number. Now, there's problems with that. We can't add up utility. But the the origin of this was, well, suppose you're, if, if we have some rule that allows us to treat people as equals, and in a democracy or in liberal theory, that's not unfair. So if we treat everyone as equals, then, you know, you can kind of add up lives or something like statistical lives saved. So it's common for us to use cost-benefit analysis as if we could add up utility. So that was one of the reasons that I got interested in this to begin with. But it's an ancient problem, and it started probably with the with the cesarean section. Now, the cesarean section, as the name suggests, was there is a child of Caesar that a woman is bearing, and the woman is sick, or at the time when the child is to be born, it's a breech birth, and you're worried that both the mother and child are going to die. Should you remove, with all of the catastrophic cutting that that implies, should you remove the baby from the mother's womb, knowing in 200 AD that that means the mother's mother dies for certain, but you might save the baby. And so the, the difficulty is that it seems like a weak Pareto improvement. They're both going to die, or maybe we can save the baby. And so the economist might say, that's a, it's a hard choice, but okay, let's do that. Philippa and Foote, just, just to, you, you used to say something about what you mean by a weak Pareto improvement. So the, the Pareto criterion that economists often use as a substitute for ethical reasoning is a way to say that suppose that everyone is better off. Two, two, two states of the world, A and B, and everyone is better off. The weak version is no one is worse off and at least one person is better off. Obviously, we have choice A, which is both the mother and the baby die. Choice B is the mother dies, but probably we can save the baby. B is better than A. As horrible as that sounds, now the difference is that in the case of the mother and the baby dying, we're doing nothing to cause that. It just happens as a result of natural events. In the case of the cesarean section, we're actively intervening to kill one of the parties. So you can see why, why and those familiar with the trolley problem can see why this is a version of the trolley problem. And on utilitarian grounds, the fact that the baby has a longer lifespan ahead of them than the mother would justify it. And the Benthamite calculus, Bentham being the father of utilitarianism, carry on. Well, and so the, the real problem was that this was Caesar's baby and no one cared about the woman. So it's in a patriarchal society. But yes, the best version you can give of it is what you said. So what Philippa Foote and I went down, I, I was preparing for this podcast, and I looked up Philippa Foote and started to read about her. She's one of the most interesting people I've ever read about. I probably spent 10 hours down the Philippa Foote rabbit hole this weekend, and I blame you personally for that, Russ. It's okay. I'm going to double your fee for this, I guess, ten, tenfold increase in your fee for this uh, episode, Mike. So that you'll makes end it up all, better off. That makes it all worthwhile. Thank you. 
So what Flippa Foot noted was that the problem of abortion often flips that calculus. So particularly in the case of a uh, difficult pregnancy that endangers the life of the mother, either both are going to die or we're going to intervene and abort the fetus and save the life of the mother. Now, the problem is that in the case of a difficult pregnancy where both might die, those are happening in the natural course of events. Or we actively intervene and kill the fetus with the hopes that it makes the mother better off because otherwise both of them would have died. If the mother dies, obviously the baby dies. And so the difference is, and this is where she pointed this out first in an article in 1967, which was where she first posits what she called the tram problem. We have translated that into English, so it's the trolley problem now. But there's a, a, a tram that is, well, let me, let me read her version of it. So it may be supposed that a person is the driver of a runaway tram, which he can only steer from one narrow track onto another. Five men are working on one track and one man on the other. Anyone on the track he enters is bound to be killed. The question is why we would say without hesitation that the driver should steer for the less occupied track while most of us would be appalled by the, at the idea that the innocent man would have been uh, killed in, on purpose. So the doctrine of double effect offers us a way out of the difficulty, insisting that it is one thing to steer toward someone foreseeing that you will kill him, and another to aim at his death as a part of your plan. In real life, it would hardly ever be certain that the man on the narrow track would be killed. Perhaps he gains a foothold on the side of the tunnel and clings on as the vehicle hurtled by. The driver of the tram does not then leap off and brain the man with a crowbar. So the point is that I have a choice between two alternatives which I did not create. And in my little essay, I try to identify the importance of this difference. So if you look at surveys of what are called the trolley problem, if I am on a runaway trolley, no brakes, no way to stop, and I'm heading towards a track that has one person who cannot escape and will be killed if I do nothing, or I can pull a switch and divert onto another track that will kill five people, but I can save the life of the one. Should I save the life of the one by acting? No one says that I should do that. No one says that I should divert and kill the five to save the one. Now, what looks like almost the same thing, but is quite different. Suppose the tram is hurtling towards down a track and there's five people on that track. Or I can divert. If I divert, it will go down a track that will kill one person. Do I do that? Now, from a sort of economic consequentialist perspective, there's no difference. But there is a difference between my intention and my acting. So the doctrine of double effect would say that any action that I take has two effects, and I have to compare their consequences. And Philippa Foote introduces this comparison uh, that she later expands on in a number of other what she called moral dilemmas. And the moral dilemma is that we feel like there's a difference in terms of moral agency. And what moral agency means is that if I allow someone to die, it is very different from me actively killing them. So first of all, I think it's fascinating. I've never read the original article. Uh, that you're reading from. I, the fact that she notes the possibility of the one person leaping aside, I think is one of the reasons that these kind of hypotheticals are, some of these hypotheticals are foolish, not so much as a conversation topic. I don't find them foolish at all. I find them very interesting. But when we when surveys are done and certain proportions of people answer one way or the other, people make big, grand conclusions about the human brain or 
about morality. And uh, I think it's very hard for most human beings answering a survey to ignore the real world aspects of the hypothetical. So in all the hypotheticals and all the survey versions, you're told the person will die with certainty yep. or they can't get out of the way, right? And there's a third version, of course, which I think we've mentioned on the program at some point where you, uh, you have a choice. You're on a footbridge and you have a chance to push a person over the footbridge to stop the train that's about to kill five people. And I, I think those survey results are very problematic because I don't think you can ignore the possibility that other things will happen. You can say, assume that, but I find that a little bit um, troubling. Let and me say, what? please, go ahead. And I think I've mentioned on the program before, when I, when I posed this problem to my children, uh, one of my kids, who at that point was like uh, 10 years old, said, well, you know, I wouldn't push the heavy person over the footbridge railing and save the others. I said, I said, why not? He said, because he might fight with me and then <laughs> I wouldn't be able to push him over and I might get pushed over. And I thought, well, that's interesting. You're supposed to ignore that. And then I realized, but most people probably don't. The idea of grappling with another human being, forget the whole issue here of, of causing the thing to happen versus allowing it to happen. The whole idea that the outcome is uncertain is just assumed away. And, and I think that makes a lot of the survey results on these problems problematic. I find the same issue with, um, you know, with Peter Singer's example of ruining your shoes to save the drowning child. Uh, and, and therefore you should, because you should ruin your shoes to save a drowning child, you should send the value of your shoes to Africa to, for malaria bed nets, where malaria is prevalent, to save lives as if it's a certainty that you can save lives by spending money, which are, tragically is not true. And I, anyway, uh, my, my only point is, is that I, I want to emphasize that in these hypotheticals, I think it's more interesting to talk about them than to judge the survey results. Right. The, this brings us to three things. One is to Adam Smith, which is the, uh, was the reason that I wrote my essay and probably the connection to econ talk in the sense that I think it's interesting. And when, if, I think if you read Adam Smith, uh, the uh, hypothetical about sacrificing one's little finger or losing one's little finger compared to 100 million people in China dying in an earthquake, um, that, that's a really interesting part of the theory of moral sentiments. But let me suggest this. This afternoon, I teach, classes are starting today at Duke, I teach the first class in the PPE gateway, philosophy, politics, and economics. And I'm going to ask them how many have seen the movie Oppenheimer. And probably a fair number of them will have seen the movie Oppenheimer. And that was not hypothetical. The United States faced two choices. It could try to develop an atomic weapon that it could use to end the war in the Pacific with Japan, or it could pursue a plan that they had come up with called Operation Downfall. And Operation Downfall was an, a systematic military ground attack of the Japanese mainland. And interestingly, after the war, uh, the, the Japanese defense plan, um, and it, it was called Operation Ketsugo. Operation Ketsugo was the fortification of much of Japan in a way that Okinawa had been fortified. And the plan that the, this is the Japanese estimate of their casualties, at least 2 million soldiers and as many as 50 million civilians would die if Operation Katsugo were triggered. And again, this is the Japanese view. It, it, it's possible that it was somewhat larger, somewhat smaller, but the Japanese themselves had decided that that was what that they were, they were going to do. The U.S. had lost 25,000 dead on Okinawa. Nearly 100,000 had been wounded or put out of action. The Japanese had lost 200,000 on Okinawa, and that was not the Japanese mainland. So the United States faced the choice. 
are we going to develop and drop atomic weapons on cities, defenseless cities, and intentionally kill women and children? Or are we going to pursue military objectives and as a side consequence, as an unavoidable side consequence, that because the enemy is resisting, is going to result in 10 times as many casualties. Now, it's the trolley problem because it is your intention to kill women and children in the case of the atomic weapon. You are actively saying we are going to drop a bomb onto an unsuspecting defenseless city and the result is going to be catastrophic deaths. And that is literally our intention. That's what we're going for. Or we can take another course of action that is within the tradition of military ethics. And so there is a, I think, the, the, the usual hypothetical about should the U.S. have dropped the atomic bomb is easy because there are far fewer casualties in the case of the atomic bomb, even in Japan. Certainly there's far fewer casualties to the United States. The estimates for the U.S. casualties were up to a million, up to a million U.S. soldiers might die in the taking of the Japanese mainland. The Japanese strategy was to, uh, and th they may have been right, that the U.S. would give up. It just wasn't worth it. At some point after two or three more years, if they continued to resist, the United States would just give up. And so the, the question is, was the United States morally justified in using atomic weapons when it involves killing, not allowing to die, when it allows killing, not allowing to die. And so um, the, the, the reason for that extended sort of claim, and let me raise one more, is, uh, and whoever is playing the, the econ talk drinking game may have to chug at this point because you've not, um, not mentioned driverless cars or autonomous cars in quite a while. It used to be a, a, a main part of the show. But if you are programming an autonomous car and there's a school bus ahead of you that you're going to hit, or you can go up onto the sidewalk and hit a woman in a baby carriage. Your choices are just to let the momentum of the car take you into the bus or go up on the sidewalk and kill the woman in the baby carriage. That's not a hypothetical. That's literally things that we have to face. So the reason to do these hypotheticals is to train the minds of the young leaders in philosophy, politics, and economics, because they are, Russ, the elite. They are the best. So the PPE students are the, clearly the smartest of all, all students because that is the major everyone should pursue. We have to train them on toy problems so that they can deal with the non-hypotheticals that they will have to deal with as tomorrow's leaders. Um, in the TV series, uh, the um, TV series uh, "The Good Place," uh, a show I enjoyed immensely. Uh, one of the characters, Chidi, C H I D I, Chidi is the philosopher uh, in the show, and he is forced. Uh, through a snap of the fingers to find he finds himself in a trolley barreling down on some workers uh there's a track he can divert to kill one worker and he's got about 10 seconds to, to make the decision and it's um highly entertaining uh and quite yeah, interesting. No, no spoiler alerts but it was highly yeah. entertaining yeah i will not i will not tell you what happens um but I'm we not will sure. link to it. It's, we it's may important. link to a, a clip from that episode, and uh, you can say with a your cup of tea if you haven't seen it. Uh, later on in the series, this I will not mention, There, there is an actual answer to the trolley problem, which I found quite provocative and interesting. Um, but in real life, you often have to make these decisions in real time. You, you don't have the luxury of... Um, sitting around in, in a seminar room. And certainly Harry Truman didn't have that luxury when deciding to drop the atomic bomb. It was not evidently, he claims, I think, it was not a hard moral decision for him. He cared about um, Americans. He's the American president. And I would just mention that a uh, quick Google search suggests that about 200,000 people died 
in the uh, bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Of course, many more had health problems related to it. But uh, 100,000 people approximately died in a single night in the Tokyo. firebombing of Tokyo, which was a horrific uh, and tragedy. It was an intentional firebombing. They waited yep. until the weather was right to have enough wind to create the firestorm. And I, again, I'm not sure that was a ser serious moral dilemma for the people who pulled the trigger on that decision. But what I, I'm only remarking on that because... And of course, neither of those casualty numbers were known in advance. No, nobody knew exactly how many people would die in either of them. But for some reason, the nuclear attacks are treated differently from the firebombing. And I, it's an example of why in these many times in these hypotheticals, there are strange intangible things that the answer hinges on for many people. In the case of the trolley problem, it's the, as you point out, for many people, it's the causing versus allowing to happen. People feel very differently about that. Why that is, we're a longer conversation another time, probably. Um, but in the case of the atomic bomb versus firebombing, for some reason, uh, the atomic bomb is put in its own unique box. And you could argue it's because it allows an unimaginable destruction in its aftermath in the future. Uh or simply because it has a technological aspect to it that is different from bombs of which human beings have had been using for some time. But I thought it was um, unintentional, or, or unintentionally ironic on your part that you mentioned that the atomic bomb was like a, a different kind of warfare. Not so much. Um, the, the standard of what was acceptable after the bombing of, of London which I think was an accident by Hitler, the bombing of civilian targets uh, opened up uh, a change the norms or at least excused a different set of norms. And we got the fire bombing of, uh, of Tokyo. There's also, of course, the fire bombing of Dresden. Uh, I'm looking that up now. Uh, 25,000. Hmm? 25,000. Only, tw quote, only 25,000. Uh, but horrific, you know, destructive one night of horror, terror, and uh, destruction for civilians. You, know, you can argue whether they're innocent or not. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of moral lines you could draw. Certainly, the, I would argue the children were innocent. Um, but you could argue more widely, depending on your perspective. But let, let's move on to Adam Smith, unless you want to respond to anything I said. It's we are in the 300th anniversary of the birth of Smith, um, so it's kind of nice that we're we're talking about him. You quickly summarized it. Well, talk about it again, and uh, let's talk about the the uh, the dilemma that Smith poses. Well, the it was actually Adam Smith that was the point of my essay because I claimed that Adam Smith had solved, and perhaps we should put that in uh, quotation marks. Adam Smith suggests a way that our intuition about what later has come to be called the trolley problem might work. So um, on page 136 of the Liberty Fund edition of theory of moral sentiments. And I should say, I first encountered this in your marvelous uh, six-part discussion with Dan Klein uh, a, a long time ago now, I think it was 2009, uh, that I, I really recommend to everyone uh, this discussion of the brilliance of the way that Smith kind of turns the tables. Because usually the story is, and I, I think it, it is worth reading just to make sure we have the context. So again, this is on page 136 in section three, chapter three. Let's suppose that the great empire of China with all its myriads of inhabitants was suddenly swallowed up by an earthquake. Let us consider how a man of humanity in Europe who had no sort of connection with that part of the world would be affected upon receiving intelligence of this dreadful calamity. So this is pretty much a, a standard person of humanity, uh, not someone who is inured to human suffering, someone who actually cares about other people. 
He would, I imagine, first of all, express very strongly his sorrow for the misfortune of that unhappy people. He would make many melancholy reflections upon the precariousness of human life and the vanity of all the labors of man, which could thus be annihilated in a moment. He would too, perhaps, if he was a man of speculation, enter into many reasonings concerning the effects which this disaster might produce upon the commerce of Europe and the trade and business of the world in general. And when all this fine philosophy was over, when all these humane sentiments had once been fairly expressed, he would pursue his business or his pleasure, take his repose or his diversion with the same ease and tranquility as if no such accident had happened. The most frivolous disaster which could befall himself would occasion a more real disturbance. If he was to lose his little finger tomorrow, he would not sleep tonight. But provided he never saw them, he will snore with the most profound security over the ruin of a hundred millions of his brethren. And the destruction of that immense multitude seems plainly an object less interesting to him than this paltry misfortune of his own. Now, usually people stop there and say, Adam Smith says we're so selfish. There's several interesting things about that. He calls Chinese our brethren which in 1759 in England, racism is pretty rampant and unquestioned. It's not clear that that is, Smith was an egalitarian. There's a thoroughgoing egalitarian. Yep. But he's actually using the fact that they are our brethren and we still don't really care as part of his point. And if you stop there, it makes you, it makes you think, you know, boy, people are just rotten, selfish pieces of work. Yeah, and it's... Um... It's a beautiful hypothetical uh, because uh, I think most of us would concede that it's true. Uh, as unpleasant and unappealing uh, it is to believe that human beings are like this, uh, most of us read news all the time about catastrophic things happening to people far away, where in his day, you know, the news would be the equivalent of watching, a, you know, supernova that uh, an event that would have occurred long ago in the past. Yeah. By the time you got news of that earthquake in China, it would have happened presumably a week at least beforehand. Uh, today we watch it live, and we still sleep like babies at night. A strange expression, actually, sleeping like a baby. It <laughs> means to sleep well. Most babies don't sleep so well, but whatever. Uh, so I, I think most of us, and I challenge all of you listening, to ask yourself how many catastrophic things we just read about. Uh, many of you, many of us watched uh, or read about the tragedy in Hawaii, a hor horrible uh, loss of life of, for many people, their own country, fellow country members. And yet, they slept fine. And yet, I think Smith is correct that if it were our own, if we knew we were going to have surgery tomorrow, even minor surgery, so-called minor surgery, which of course is surgery that happens to someone else, uh, there is no such thing as minor surgery for ourselves, we'd sleep badly. We'd be troubled. This, is, this we, is disfiguring. You're going to lose your little finger. They're going to cut off part of your hand. And it's painful. And it's uncertain about the real full consequences it's coming awful. back to the awful. ability to talk about hypotheticals. But let's say, try to pretend that it's only your little finger. It's still your little finger. That's, and the, it's hard. the power is that it's your little finger. Yeah. That he's probably right. I would be more upset about the prospective loss of my little finger than I would the deaths of many people that I don't know, that I have no personal connection with at least in the psychological impact on our day-to-day -day equanimity. That, that's yeah, I mean, what he, Smith is, is he, literally he's, saying. He's, he's talking about the way that we live our lives. So I would think of that, and I would go for a walk, in fact. I might even cry a little. I would be upset. That's just so awful that this has happened. And then I'd have dinner. Yeah. So carry on, though. That is very important um, that that is not the end of Smith's discussion, but it is often where... It's uh, ended in pop, it's when other people write about it, but he goes on. Well, and it is a fair place to end in terms of an outline. So, you know, what I read, full stop, that's an important point. We have now set 
one important uh, standard. Then he continues, and he he's not a big guy on paragraph, so it's it's still the same paragraph. To prevent, therefore, this paltry misfortune to himself, would a man of humanity be willing to sacrifice the lives of a hundred million of his brethren, provided he had never seen them? Human nature startles with horror at the thought, and the world, in its greatest depravity and corruption, never produced such a villain as could be capable of entertaining it. Now, I think that's not right. But there there are <laughs> sociopaths who would who might very well consider that, or like the Joker on Batman. So the yeah. but that's why he's so horrible, right. is that there's just wanton or in uh, no no country for old men the sort of chaos figure. He's so horrible precisely because he would consider it. Meaning a person who would sacrifice the hundred million foreigners to save one's own little finger, which didn't come out in that reading, by the way. I'm not sure why. Um, you said just to sacrifice. You didn't say to save little finger. Did you, did you skip ahead or? No, I, I continued. Okay, but, carry on. But, the, but let me say it again because it wasn't clear. To prevent, therefore, this paltry misfortune to himself, that saved the little finger. Yeah. Would a man of humanity be willing to sacrifice the lives of a hundred millions of his brethren, provided he had never seen them? Human nature startles with horror at the thought, and the world in its greatest depravity and corruption never produced such a villain as could be capable of entertaining it. But what makes this difference? When our passive feelings are almost always so sordid and selfish, how comes it that our active principles should often be so generous and noble? When we are always so much more deeply affected by whatever concerns ourselves than by whatever concerns other men, what is it which prompts the generous upon all occasions, and the mean even upon many, to sacrifice their own interest to the greater interest of others? Now, there, and, there's more. There's more to be said, and he, he says a couple more important yeah, things. Yeah, hang on. Well, we're, I want you to read that part, too, but just, just to summarize here, what he's saying is that you've told me already you care about your little finger more than you do about the death of 100 million because it keeps you up at night and the other thing doesn't. And yet, when you have a chance to act and save your little finger, which you care more about, according to your emotional response— you won't do it. And that to me is the – if he'd been writing the book in 2023, he might have started instead of being on 136. I know there's some preamble in the Liberty Fund edition, but it's not the opening. It would have been a great opening few pages. Instead, it opens much more um, diffidently uh, and, and in a more challenging way to follow. But that is essentially the setup for the theory of moral sentiments. I just want to say, by the way, uh, Mike, that I was in uh, Scotland a week and a half ago, and I was in Edinburgh for the first time, and I was able to go to Adam Smith's house, Pamir House, where he spent the last 12 years of his life uh, living with his mom. And in the front of that, as you enter that um, that building, there is a copy of the Theory of Moral Sentiments open there. And it comes with a subtitle I had not seen. It is an essay towards an analysis of the prince. It's, it's the theory of moral sentiments or an essay towards an analysis of the principles by which men naturally judge concerning the conduct and character first of their neighbors and afterwards of themselves. Now, I mention that only because it's a very useful <laughs> bit of verbiage to help you understand what the theory of moral sentiments is really about, given that we don't use the phrase moral sentiments in the way that today that Smith did. But that's what it's about. It's about judging the character and, and actions of your neighbors and of yourself. And so what he's saying is that, okay, this is who we are. We don't care much about others. We care more about ourselves. We are self-interested, but we are not selfish. We do not kill others, most of us, to save a small amount of ourself. And that's a startling and bold claim, which I also believe is true. I have 
I have an embarrassing admission, and that is because I am so much more of a fanboy of you than you are of yourself, which is as should be. Um, Dan Klein read the subtitle that you just gave in your six part uh, econ talk about it, which of course you wouldn't know. This is like somebody goes up to somebody from the Eagles and what, what, how did you write these lyrics? I have no idea. I don't remember that, but you know, the fanboy has memorized them and expects you to have memorized all this. You have seen it before. At least you've heard uh, it, well, <laughs> but that was this 2009. Kid, the, the 2009, but this confirms Adam Mastriani's claim that the brain is not connected to the ears episode of a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> you didn't read it. You said you had not read it before. Actually, you, <laughs> technically you have saved yourself. But you I had heard, heard it. it. Yes. I, that's embarrassing. Okay. Because Dan, unsurprisingly, <laughs> thought it was important that that, yeah. that that subtitle is is important to understanding it. So before I continue to give Smith's explanation, in my essay, I say Adam Smith if he had had the opportunity, would have posed the question in the language of the trolley problem. So there's a trolley hurtling down a track, and it happens that I am stuck beside the track and my little finger is stuck in the track. And if the trolley continues on its current course, it will cut off my finger. Or I have a switch and I can pull the switch and it will divert the trolley onto a path where it will kill 100 million. Now, that's actually a really difficult problem since I also control the switch, but that's Smith's formulation. So we could take one step back and have a sort of an A and B version. The A version is I, a disinterested, impartial spectator, am I have control of the switch and I see it's heading towards you, Russ Roberts, and it's gonna cut off your little finger or I can divert it and it will kill 100 million people. I hope you don't mind, but you're going to lose your finger. Now, it's interesting to ask whether having control of the switch yourself, would you actually have the self-control, the, the self-governance? Because that's what Smith, the Stoic, is advocating for, is that we would actually have the self-governance that we would not press the switch. I, and of course, he's right. If I did panic and push the switch and 100 million were killed to save my little finger, people would be horrified. And rightly so. That was an awful thing to do. So I hope that I would have the self-control to have it continue along that path. Before you get to Smith's answer, I just want to add one thing, because you're talking about self-sacrifice and you being in charge of the switch versus me being in charge of the switch. Um, I always find it interesting when we read about the moral failures of others, people will often say, well, I wouldn't have. I would have done something different or I wouldn't have. And I was thinking, mm, I don't think that's true, probably, but it's nice to say. So, for example, the brave Germans who took Jews into their houses or Poles who took Germans and, and took Jews into their houses during the Holocaust, uh, or th let's take those who didn't, those who gave away the hiding places of Jews uh, to curry favor with the Nazis. People would say, well, I would never do that. Well, wait till you're in that situation. You're worried about your own family. And I don't judge people who I, I hoped I wouldn't have done that if I had been a Pole. I hope that as a Pole, I would have harbored Jews and risked my own life. But if I'm risking my, my family's life, it starts to get complicated. But my point is that a person would, I think many people harbored Jews it, it didn't take a family of five to make it a morally worthwhile thing to do. Nobody said, well, let's see, I'm risking my own life, but I could save five, so I'll do that. They said, they didn't do that. They weren't utilitarian. They said, this is the right thing to do. There's a small number who did it. Uh, I think it's incredibly courageous. Uh, those are people who gave up more than their little finger. They gave up the uh, peace of mind that they could have had by doing nothing and risk their own lives, often risk their families' lives to save people uh, who weren't them. And so, you know, when you talk about, uh, you'd hope that I would give up my little finger to save 100 million, yeah, I hope so too, but uh, maybe not everybody would have done it. And certainly if, if I, talking about risking my little finger to save your leg or your, uh, your arm or hand, 
it starts to get even more complicated. So I, the reason I like the putting Smith's claim in the trolley formulation, the trolley problem formulation, is that it does allow you to change that out a little bit. So suppose instead of your little finger, it was you. Yeah. Or your family. Yeah. Now, I still think Smith's analysis go through, but gosh, that's an awful kind of situation. And that's closer to the... Um, sheltering the Jews problem is that I'm not actually going to lose my little finger if this goes wrong. I'm going to lose a lot, but only in probability. There's, but there's a pretty good chance. So the, I wrote down peace of mind, and I think we should come back to that because it actually it's put a stake in the question of peace of mind, because it's actually peace of mind that has to do with Smith's answer. Smith, to, to review, we've talked about a bunch of stuff. Smith has posed a puzzle. It's not a hypothetical. It's a puzzle. So if you accept his premise, and I think I do, the, the premise is that I'd be more upset about the prospect of losing my little finger than I am upset in terms of actual material day-to-day -day life by hearing of the distant death of 100 million people that I do not know. But I would sacrifice my little finger for, to save those 100 million people. So that seems like a preference reversal. That seems like something behavioral economists would say that's a paradox. So one of the reasons why some people say Smith was the, the sort of poor behavioral economist was he came up with these preference reversals and then came up with explanations for them. Before you go farther, um, further, I, I, you actually, I, I think, unintentionally changed Smith a little bit, which normally I would say it's no big deal, but in this case, it kind of is a big deal. You, you gave the example of that I would sacrifice my little finger to save the 100 million. He actually, I think, talks about would I kill the 100 million to save my little finger? It, it, in a way, it's the same thing, but in these kind of goofy philosophical hypotheticals, they're different yep. slightly. Because what, what he says is uh, – is he willing to sacrifice the lives of a hundred million to prevent this paltry misfortune to himself? Yeah. So you, you are right that that is the formulation. So uh, his answer is, and we, we finished with, and what makes this difference? When we are always so much more deeply affected by whatever concerns ourselves then by whatever concerns other men, what is it which prompts the generous upon all occasions and the mean upon many to sacrifice their own interests to the greater interests of others? So a generous person by definition is willing to sacrifice their own interests, but the mean upon many occasions, that is people who are by no means generous are still willing to sacrifice their own interests to the greater interests of others. And this is just beautiful. It is not the soft power of humanity. It is not that feeble spark of benevolence which nature has lighted up in the human heart that is thus capable of counteracting the strongest impulses of self-love. So it's not a contest between self-love and benevolence. That is my primary caring about other people. It is a stronger power, a more forcible motive, which exerts itself upon such occasions. It is reason, principle, conscience, the inhabitant of the breast, the man within, the great judge and arbiter of our conduct. It is he who, whenever we are about to act so as to affect the happiness of others, calls to us with a voice capable of astonishing the most presumptuous of our passions, that we are not but one of the multitude, in no respect better than any other in it. And that when we prefer ourselves so shamefully and so blindly to others, we become the proper objects of resentment, abhorrence, and execration. It is from him only that we learn, and that him is the, the, the impartial spectator. It is from him only that we learn the real littleness of ourselves. And whatever relates to ourselves and the natural misinterpretations of self-love can be corrected only by the eye of this impartial spectator. It is he who shows us the propriety of generosity and the deformity of injustice, the propriety of resigning the greatest interests of our own for the yet greater interest of others, and the deformity of doing the smallest injury to another 
in order to obtain the greatest benefit to ourselves. It is not the love of our neighbor. It is not the love of mankind, which upon many occasion prompts us to the practice of these divine virtues. It is a stronger love, a more powerful affection, which generally takes place upon such occasions. The love of what is honorable and noble, of the grandeur, dignity, and superiority of our own characters. I, I have goosebumps from reading that. Yeah, it's um, it's a very subtle formulation. It's a little bit contradictory. And, you know, obviously, like we've talked about it before on the program, and we've, for the drinking game, people waiting for the quote, Smith says man naturally desires not only to be um, love, but to be lovely. That is, you're pretending, to not only... you are pretending not to know that. Come on. No, I was struggling there. <laughs> it's been a long day here in Jerusalem. Uh, I, I did blank out for a minute. I'm thinking, did I get that right? Uh, and I think I got it right. If, if not, we'll find 80 or 90 other episodes where we can that, patch in the that right quote. That may be the best moment in the history of econ, <laughs> dog. <laughs> So by that, Smith meant praise word lovely. He meant, he said, we desire to be loved. We desire to be, to earn the respect and, and admiration and praise of others. And uh, we, we want to earn it honestly. We want to be not just love, but lovely. We want to be praiseworthy. Um, and, and yet that's not exactly what he says in that passage, right? He, the, the passage that we want, desire to be loved and lovely says, we often behave well because we want other people to respect us and we want to be worthy of that respect. And this passage you just read is an, really in a way an elaboration, even though I think it precedes the quote that, I, that I'm uh, quoting. It's really elaborating on what it means to be lovely, that your self-image, that you, you, you use the idea of an impartial spectator who's not you and not one of the Chinese – you use this impartial spectator as your standard of conduct that is someone who is disinterested, impartial. And so which is it? Is it, is it utilitarian on my part? Wrong use, wrong word. Is it utility driven on my part that, that I want uh, – I'm going to behave well because I want other people to like me? Or is it the fact that I have a standard for myself of behavior? a nobleness, a grandeur, a conscience, and um, they're not exactly the same thing. And what Smith is saying, subtle, is that they, they both work together to keep me from doing the most self-ish uh, things that come naturally to me. Uh, to be self-interested is, is who I am. And yet I sometimes and often rise above that because I want to earn the respect of others and I want earn respect, self-respect. And I think that's uh, it's a very deep and um, thoughtful formulation. I want to defend Smith here as being coherent, though difficult. And you actually already foreshadowed the answer by saying peace of mind. And so uh, it's just going to take me a minute to get back to that. What Smith is imagining is that we carry very much, we care very much about being uh, approved of by others. And over time, we develop the habit of acting in a way that should elicit approval of others because we become aware of manners in the system of propriety that has been developed by the great author of nature to ensure the things we approve of are good and the things we disapprove are bad. And so we actually stop looking to others for approval, though we still care about it. What we mainly look for is our well-formed and carefully habituated impartial spectator. And a person of propriety has an impartial spectator that is actually better than the momentary reaction of the people around us. I might not, I might do something that doesn't immediately get approval, but I've thought about this and it's the right thing to do. And I'm in some cases able to console myself with that, though it still hurts to be disapproved of. 
And so the reason why actually I was pursuing peace of mind if I was someone who sheltered Jews or someone who was oppressed was I would have felt even worse if I had not done that because it would not have been in accordance with what I know to be the right thing to do. I would have been sacrificing the lives of others to save my own little finger or the, the equivalent of that. And so it is, it's actually for peace of mind. He is literally arguing for peace of mind here. And in the next paragraph, I think he explains why. And as far as I can tell, Philippa Foote never cited this, but it is exactly her contrast between allowing and causing harm. So let me read it. Just continuing on, uh, on page 137, when the happiness or misery of others depends in any respect upon our conduct, we dare not, as self-love might suggest to us, prefer the interest of one to that of many. The man within immediately calls to us that we value ourselves too much and other people too little, and that by doing so, we render ourselves the proper object of the contempt and indignation of our brethren. Neither is this sentiment confined to men of extraordinary magnanimity and virtue. So again, it's not just the generous, but even those who are mean. It is deeply impressed upon every tolerably good soldier who feels that he would become the scorn of his companions if he could be supposed capable of shrinking from danger. One individual must never prefer himself so much, even to any other individual, as to hurt or injure that other in order to benefit himself, though the benefit to the one should be much greater than the hurt or injury to the other. So that's literally the trolley problem. Even if it would benefit one much more than it would the other if I act to impose that harm and that benefit, then I am behaving badly just on its face. It's different. It's one thing to allow. So if it's, if it's hurtling towards the one person, of course, I will not switch it. But if it's hurtling towards the five, I feel really bad about switching it towards the one because it is my act that is causing the harm. Yeah, and, and obviously, in a certain perspective, there it's easy to call them equivalent. Uh, well, they are in one sense, in the utilitarian sense, they are shoving someone into a into a um, a deep body of water, like San Francisco Bay. Uh, near Alcatraz seems very different from failing to rescue them. Um, again, assuming that we'll assume that you can swim so well that it, you can bring the person back. Uh, and yet we feel differently about them. Uh, but but it, what this all reminds me of, and you can ignore this, and, and if you want to make it a, a broader point, please do. But again, as much as I love Adam Smith, and has, as much as I've learned from him, a criticism you could make at this point is that as an armchair theorist, he's hampered by the circle he <laughs> inhabits. And when your best friend's David Hume and you hang out with people like uh, Hume and others in, in uh, Edinburgh and elsewhere, you may have a, a uh, slightly distorted view of, of human nature. Uh, if Smith were literally right in that passage, if that passage was accurate, we would not worry about externalities in economics. We would just say, well, they don't, they're not important because people internalize them because of the man in the breast. They would never pollute or litter or do things that harmed other people because they would be aware that they were putting themselves forward. Uh, and of course, later on, Smith talks about our ability to self-deceive, <laughs> that that in the heat of the moment, the passion of the moment, we will we often fool ourselves and and lie, but in the calm that follows, we'll reflect on it and realize we have been less than lovely. But the, the impression you get from passages like that is that many of the social problems that bedevil modern society should go away without any type of policy intervention because we're all decent chaps and uh 
as economists, we tend to be skeptical of that answer. And worse, maybe in teaching our students that, they misunderstand what the definition of rationality is, which is a whole other uh, can of worms we're not going to open right now. But my point is, is that that's a powerful and eloquent defense of our natural inclination to do the right thing. But we know, and again, I think Smith knew, and he writes about it, that we often don't do the right thing. So it, it, he, he, he did recognize it's complicated. Well, partly this is exhortation that he wants people to recognize that a society that operates according to these principles is going to be a better society. Now, he's not an anarchist. There are all sorts of reasons why it takes more than that. But if we act in accordance with our natural principles, rather than being beaten down and becoming selfish, the society will be better off. Well, he goes on one little bit more. I Let me just cite two more things. We're coming to the end of our time. When the happiness or misery, and this is uh, Smith, page 138 in Theory of Moral Sentiments, when the happiness or misery of others indeed in no respect depends upon our conduct, when our interests are altogether separated and detached from there so that there is neither connection nor competition, we do not always think it's so necessary to restrain our natural and perhaps improper anxiety about our own affairs or our natural and perhaps equally important indifference about those of other men. So this is about moral agency, and that's what the trolley problem is about also. So there's really two issues here. One, I think, is... Smith's perhaps excessive optimism about this being an actual solution. And I read that as exhortation. It's fair enough to say it would be better if society operated that way. The other is his extremely elegant solution of the problem of why it is that we think it's different to uh, divert and kill one or no, do nothing and kill one. That is the, the Philippa Foote's later distinction between allowing and killing. So the other thing that I thought was great was uh, Smith raises a question of how much it is that we know. And so the fact that I don't really know the 100 million people, I don't have any sort of direct connection, it's difficult for me to establish some kind of empathy with them. He said, two different sets of philosophers have attempted to teach us this hardest of all lessons of morality. And that, that hardest of all lessons is that we, we only care about ourselves, and yet morality says that we should care about others, and we do if we have any active role in it. So uh, one of labor to increase our sensibility to the interests of others, the, uh, another to diminish that of our own. So one is care less about yourself, and one is you should care more about others. The first are those whining and melancholy moralists who are perpetually reproaching us with our happiness, while so many of our brethren are in misery, who regard as impious the natural joy of prosperity, which does not think of the many wretches that are every instant laboring under all sorts of calamities, in the languor of poverty, in the agony of disease, in the horrors of death, under the insults and oppression of their enemies. So at this point, you have to give Peter Singer a little bit of credit. The effective altruism movement is saying we actually can do something and we can get information that Adam Smith was not able to get. And Adam Smith's time, as you said, it was, it's like a supernova. This happened months ago. Well, this is happening now in Africa, in South America, or maybe an earthquake in China. And as a result, it is possible for us to act on the impulse to sacrifice some small amount from ourselves and try to help someone else. And so the, the, I, I bet that there was a uh, philosophy softball team at Princeton called the Winding and Melancholy Moralists. Because I, I think that's just, a, it's either a great band name or a, 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 an intramural softball team name. But the, the, the whining and melancholy moralists are constantly trying to get us to think about other people. 
And we don't because, you know, failing to act is not actually that important, but it has become relatively more important. And I should note that the next uh, episode of The Answer is Transaction Cost, my podcast, takes up this question. Because in a way, it's a question of transaction cost. Do I, do I know two things? First, do I know that the suffering is real? And second, do, the, do I know that if I make some kind of contribution, it will actually be received and used by the people that I care about? So I, I, I think that it is interesting that... Uh, Smith sort of foresees this, but also raises it as a kind of transaction cost question, which in principle might be changed if our ability to know things is modified. So I disagree with that, um, with the the role of information. I, I think the transaction cost is crucial, but um, I think the a key part of Singer's claim, I think Singer's claim which I disagree with, Singer's claim is that you care more about your child than a strange child. Therefore, you throw a birthday party for your child and you fail to save a foreign child from malaria, the death by malaria. And Singer exhorts us to rise above that natural inclination and um, that self-interest and care as much about the foreign child as the your own child. And I disagree with that calculus. I want to that's another that's that's a, a subject for another time. But I want to so in that sense I think the information is not the central piece of of the challenge of of the drowning child or, or the not that's not a good example, not the drowning child. Uh the child who's at risk of malaria death. Um I want to ask I want to close with a different question. Do you think capitalism and the commercial society encourages us to put ourselves in before others? Uh, many people believe that, that very common argument. Smith would not have agreed with that, I don't think. But you, you can give me Smith's view and you can give me M Mike Munger's view. Do you believe that we are coarsened by the competitive nature of capitalism um, and, and tend to frequently ask, what's in it for me? Smith is explicitly saying, what's in it for me is the first question we, that comes to mind. He then argues, I think the second question is, that should come to mind and often does, is what's in it for others and therefore, I should not always do what's in it for me. Uh, what do you think about those questions? Smith is relying on a pre-existing system of propriety at the social level and the cultivation of self-governance at the individual level. In that context, I think he rightly thinks capitalism does not coarsen or make us more selfish. But remember, Smith in Theory of Moral Sentiments talks about four sources of sentiments. The first is my impulse to act to help others. The second is the reaction of other people to my attempts to help. Are they grateful? Do they show gratitude? Is something they actually want? And the third is, does this comport with my sense of propriety culturally? Is, are these, this satisfy the norms of the way that people should act? It is only the fourth our appreciation of the well-contrived machine of commercial society that is a mechanism for elaborating division of labor. So in Smith's system, capitalism does not coarsen us because we have those four sources of moral sentiments, and the first three are still operating in most of our personal relationships. But it is crucial that the, the well-contrived machine of division of labor be able to operate at sufficient scale because it's limited by the extent of the market. So our wealth and prosperity can coexist with the sense of social relations we have from the first three sources of moral sentiments. That balance, I think, has not been well defended by classical liberals. Classical liberals have often come pretty close to saying, well, markets are really all that we need. And then each of us will go off and pursue our own sense of how happiness. We can all be atomistic and it'll work out fine. That's not true. 
And so if you just say that, that we don't need any social relations, we don't need to be embedded in a social context, all we need is markets to provide wealth. And from that, we'll have these little goo and our pockets will be full of tweezer holders and all the operos machines that Smith said, that's stupid. That's not the source of happiness. Then yes, we can be coarsened by capitalism. I would just add that Smith thought that capitalism, commercial society, buying and selling, um, forces to often put ourselves in the shoes of our neighbors figure out what they what they need, what would make them happy, and that actually not just doesn't course in us, but actually makes us more uh, sympathetic to what our brethren need. And Virgil, but I want to close. Virgil Storr has written about that. So a number of people have written about capitalism as creating a moral space in which people can cultivate those other sources of moral sentiments. That's certainly right. But I do want to agree with you that the culture that surrounds us uh, is always up for grabs, and uh, it can exist in the socialist and in capitalist societies. My answer to my own question about whether capitalism is uh, creates self-ish people is compared to what? Um, the Soviet Union was not a particularly empathetic place when only certain people could get apartments and and so on. It, it wasn't a, a, a love fest of... Um, of um, Kumbaya. So, and certainly a coarse culture can exist with capitalism or with socialism. And uh, without the culture you're talking about that Smith advocated for, uh, I think it, it struggles, both all systems struggle to, to lead to human flourishing. Um, I want to close and just ask you to summarize, you said it beautifully, but you said it fairly quickly. And for listeners who've been overwhelmed by the different scenarios we've talked about, uh, I want you to restate, if you would, how Smith, quote, solves the puzzle, not of what to do or what the right thing to do is in the trolley problem, but why we feel differently about certain scenarios within the trolley problem, why there seems to be inconsistency between um, how we feel, say, and how we act, which is the problem that he poses. Not exactly the trolley problem, but you've applied it there. So try to summarize that again for listeners who've um, in the middle of their commute or walking their dog or thinking, you know, that's really interesting, but what, what was the bottom line again? So take a shot at it. So Smith poses a dilemma, a puzzle. Why is it that we care more about our little finger than a hundred million people in China or some faraway country that we don't know those people of them dying or coming to grief. And we care more about them. We care more about a little finger in the sense that we are more upset by the prospect of in our everyday life. That is more of an, an upset. Um, there, there's no way to say how much we care, but in terms of how much I am upset, I'm, I care more about my little finger. On the other hand, if I have a chance to act on that impulse, impulse, I not only reverse it, but there's just no question that I would not bear the sacrifice of 100 million lives to save my little finger, to accept your correction. I mean, that, that, that is the way that Smith actually uh, states it. And then he gives a solution to that, and that is he thinks that there is a difference between accepting the consequences of things that are happening in the world and our own obligations of moral agency to act. And that, I think that solution not only is right, that given a chance to act, I should, and in fact, I would satisfy the dictates of the impartial spectator to saying, you, you're a monster. If you would say, no, no, I care more about my little finger than the 100 million people, if I actually had the chance to make a difference, if I could act in the world in a way that would have an effect on that. What I think is interesting is that that answer, if you pick it up and take it over to the trolley problem, also solves the trolley problem. So Smith is not actually addressing the trolley problem because it had not been stated. It was not stated until 1967 by Philippa Foote. 
But Philippa Foote actually proposes almost Smith's solution. She uses different words. The words that she uses are that there's a difference between allowing a harm and causing a harm. There's a difference between allowing a death and killing. And that's exactly the point that Smith was making. I would not act to kill or even to harm someone else in order to save myself some harm if it is actually my action that makes the difference. And that's the essence of the trolley problem is when we're in a position to act ourselves, we're much more reluctant to accept an outcome, which if it's the default, we're happy to allow. Beautifully said. My guest today has been Mike Munger. Mike, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks, Rutz. Thanks so much. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.